hey everybody, I'm Adrian Diglio. I'm uh, from Microsoft. I'm here to talk about uh, real world open source software supply chain threats and why you need a holistic security strategy to address them. Um, so quickly, a bit about me. Uh, I'm a principal uh, product manager um, and I lead the secure software supply chain uh, effort inside Microsoft. Um, I'm also the original author that, that published the Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework, which I'm here to introduce to you today. Um, and uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff in the open source community, especially uh, OpenSSF. And um, yeah, so let's, let's get started. And that's, that's what I look like when I'm wearing a suit. So, uh, okay. So I think uh, to, to kind of uh, frame the problem that we're dealing with here, I think we all understand that open source is used prevalently across modern software development today. So like 98% of code bases contain open source. So uh, that's a very large part of any organization's software supply chain because organization is brought in from external into your development environment. And Microsoft is no uh, exception. Microsoft loves open source, right? We use uh, across all of our code bases uh, across the company, over 83,000 unique different open source packages used more than 11 million different times across all the different repositories that we have. So this problem became very near and dear to our hearts because we love open source, we love all the benefits that it provides to developers, but there's also um, problems that come with it, such as attackers have been shifting left. Hopefully you've all seen this uh, from Sonatype. They produce a great annual report that kind of characterizes uh, the threat landscape today in, in the open source ecosystem. So, uh, and in fact, last year in 2023, over two times more attacks happened last year than all the previous years combined. So this is starting to see exponential growth, um, which is really scary. And so, but, but how, how does that affect us? If attackers are targeting open source, what, what does that mean to you and your development team or you and your organization? Um, so in order to become better defenders, we should study offense. I know that's a like sports analogy, but it's true in cybersecurity as well. And so uh, for those that aren't familiar, uh, these, these phases across the top is what's known as uh, the cyber kill chain, which is a, a registered trademark of uh, Lockheed Martin who came up with that. And it's essentially the steps that any attacker goes through when they're performing and planning out their attack. And, um, and this kind of like legitimizes defense in depth because if the attacker performs everything from left to right, but we stop them from the final attack on objective, we as defenders are winning. And that's why you need multiple layers of defense. So anyways, uh, when you look at this and you see there's, okay, there's pre-compromise, the attacker is, uh, is figuring out what, what uh, weapon they wanna use and how they wanna deploy it. And then there's the initial compromise phase. And then once they get their foot in the door, that's when they start doing all the post-compromise activity and they start uh, laterally moving uh, or escalating permissions within your environment as they move towards the objective, their final objective that they want to accomplish within your environment. So uh, when in the context of open source, well, developers download a lot of open source. Uh, I'm talking about like language packages, like, like Nougat, NPM, PyPy, Rust crates, Maven packages. Um, so if a open source package is now malicious, as we just saw on the previous slide, in the um, cyber kill chain, that is the delivery phase. That is the attacker choosing open source as the delivery vehicle, because when a developer downloads it, they are now executing that payload in their environment. And we're gonna review a lot of these uh, uh, malicious open source packages uh, later through this, this compromise, but there's also different types of threats too. There's not just malicious open source like we saw on the previous slide. There's also the everyday um, CVE and vulnerability and what that means to your running application that's using that open source. Um, and so uh, 
when we review some of these uh, malicious open source packages, some of the common behavior that we've seen is that they usually compromise the developer's identity. So if the developer's downloading it to their, to their dev box, or it's being uh, downloaded uh, at build time and it's compromising the build machine, most of the times it's exfiltrating some sort of uh, developer identity token to some attacker remote controlled server. So then that's gonna ask the question, what else do developers have access to? Once their identity is compromised because they just unknowingly downloaded a compromised component, what else can the, the developer do within your environment because now they have access? And uh, source control, your, your build pipelines, your release pipelines, your applications that get deployed to production, right? The, the CI CD infrastructure that many corporations use today it, uh, is how we deliver code into production environments. So compromising developer environments is a great way for attackers to then further compromise production environments. So to kind of recap, I think we all understand that open source is used extensively. It's considered infrastructure in the software industry. Attackers are targeting open source, which also means that they're targeting developers and they're targeting our developer environments. And so arguably, I think this means that open source is the most important aspect of any organization's software supply chain. So I'm gonna walk you through a dozen different examples of real world incidents. Um, and it's gonna span you know, both malicious open source and your kind of common everyday uh, CVE vulnerabilities. Because those are two different types of threats. And, uh, and then finally, of course, winky face, how to mitigate them with a holistic strategy. Okay, so let's begin. So the first one I wanna talk about is how attackers were able to compromise um, a CVE uh, within three days of it being published. So in this particular example, this is from uh, Sonatype's State of Software Supply Chain Report in 2020, um, the salt stack uh, PyPy package, uh, they did the appropriate thing. They, they learned about the vulnerability confidentially and then they worked on the fix and they published the fixed version at the same time they published the CVEs. So now everybody knows they have a CVE and they have a patch that they can upgrade to that, that fixes it. That's perfect. The problem is many places take way too long to get around to updating their dependencies. And attackers were able to research the vulnerability, craft an exploit, find systems in the wild that were still using the unpatched version and begin actively exploiting within three days. And so as cyber defenders kind of have to ask yourself, how do you win? How do, how do you defend against this? And I think that's why every organization, every software development team, company should have a North Star to update your dependencies within three days. Because that's how we as defenders can operate faster than the attackers can. And that's how we can win. If you know the concept about OODA loops, which is kind of like a military term, um, observe, orient, um, deploy, and, oh, that's embarrassing. Whatever the A is, um, um, it's all about uh, responding within the, the environment. And, and being able to react within the, the information that you have. And so if attackers are able to attack us within three days of knowing this information, we should be able to defend ourselves within three days of knowing that information. All right, a different type of uh, incident that affected us, this is back in 2016. So yes, I am gonna go through some historical examples, hopefully remind us and refresh us about why uh, certain software practices are the way they are today. But um, LeftPad was a very popular package and the uh, author and maintainer unpublished, it was just a 17 lines of code, but they unpublished it and all of the headlines said, quote unquote, broke the internet because everybody's builds started breaking because people were calling 
for the left pad package direct from the public internet. And we should no longer, as, as software development um, matures and practices mature, you shouldn't have a, a direct reliance on the public internet. You should be caching your packages using an artifact repository. And so you should be migrating to this type of a model. That way the packages are, are stored locally for the entire development team in a CI CD environment. And that's how you, you know, uh, survive against uh, availability issues. Because if the upstream goes down, you can continue to build. A different type of attack is uh, uh, based on uh, uh, the behavior of, of how certain clients uh, fetch uh, packages. So if you haven't heard about dependency confusion, I'm gonna walk you through how this works. So with all the different language package ecosystems, you have a package source file. So for NuGet, you have a NuGet.config. For NPM, you have a .npmrc file. And those files show, here's the places where I wanna retrieve my packages from, right? So in this example, I have a NuGet.config that lists three different locations about where I wanna retrieve my dependencies from. NuGet.org, public internet, feed A, and feed B. In feed B, I have a package called foo version 1.3.0, and that's an internal only package that I'm using. It's not available externally. But an attacker learns that I have a package with that name, and they realize that the public package repository does not have any package associated with that name. So they upload a malicious package, exact same name, and they rev the version super high, so like 9.9.9. .9 .9. And the way that a lot of these um, uh, package clients work is uh, if they have multiple feeds, they call all of them simultaneously, and the first one to respond serves up the package. And so that's how um, I could have been expecting foo version 1.3.0, but instead NuGet may have served me version 9.9.9. .9 and um, while this behavior is not limited to just NuGet, um, I do wanna point out that um, NuGet went and then addressed this, so now you can actually uh, use package source mapping, that's a, a native capability, so that you could be very deterministic about where you retrieve your packages from. Another type of um, a supply chain attack is typo squatting. This is where um, they usually typo squat on the name of the package, but there are other types of typo squatting. Um, type, this is where they take, they go after a package that's usually popular and they change the name by just one character or so because the developer may mistakenly mistype it when they are running like npm install blah, right? Um, and you can see that it, it's actually pretty successful despite how uh, of much of a low sophistication attack this is, um, it's still working today. You could see that the original package was Colorama at the top, but then there are uh, variations that are using like the British spelling like Colorama um, and Colorama API um, or misspelling color, C-O-L-A-R-A-M-A. -A. Um, and you could see that, that people still over a thousand people still downloaded this package that had nothing to do with the original and it was just um, malicious. And um, so that's just an example of this is just a technique that they're using to trick you to download malware, right? Um, other examples are, uh, this happened in 2018, um, the ESLint scope incident. This, this may have been, um, it was, it was widely popular at the time. Um, this is where the attacker maintained uh, or obtained the, the maintainer's NPM account auth credentials, and they uploaded a new version of ESLint-scope. So the newest version was, is the malicious version. And so anybody that wasn't using a lock file and they had the little caret icon, which meant that they're willing to accept upgrades from that version um, they would auto-download the latest version, and then they were 
downloading this malicious package, which then, as soon as you run it, it grabs your machines .mpmrc auth file and sent it off to a remote attacker controlled server. So these attackers are harvesting credentials at scale because you could imagine how popular these packages are and they're getting developers tokens from multiple different companies. And so you can imagine the infrastructure that developers have to maintain to make sure that they, they keep all that organized and they know which auth token will work in what target company because they likely don't want to target every company they likely have specific target customers in mind. Um, note, this is why pinning your dependencies is recommended. Um, and as, you know, while this happened in 2018, you can see from the report from Sonentype that there were like 200 something malicious packages, 200,000 malicious packages found last year. Um, another similar incident is where um, an attacker who was a contributor to a project, um, EventStream, this also happened in 2018. They um, used a little bit of social engineering to convince the maintainer to add a brand new dependency, right? So these are the transitive dependencies. So EventStream was a very popular package, nothing bad, nothing compromised happened there, but they just added a new dependency so that all users of EventStream would then have to download um, and install all these transitive dependencies as well. And they added flat map stream, which was a very targeted uh, piece of malware because it was going after users of Copay, looking for Bitcoin and harvesting um, their pro private keys so that they can then uh, steal Bitcoin because, you know, why run a crypto mining factory when you can just steal from others, I guess. so. Um, all right, bad joke. Okay, um, another type of an attack is um, end of support. I think we're all familiar with end of support, especially around um, commercial organizations. Um, usually when something's not supported anymore, it's possible that vulnerabilities can be discovered, but because it's not supported, you're never gonna get that, that fix to update to. So um, this was an interesting case where Log4Net uh, voted in April 2022 to go dormant. And um, then the very next month in May 2020, uh, they published a CVE. And this CVE has a CVSS score of 9.8 critical. And um, in the response from Apache here, they just left a mitigation statement. They said, like, unfortunately, we voted that this is dormant, so we're not gonna fix this. So, um, you know, we agree that users should not allow arbitrary configuration files to be specified from untrusted sources. So, uh, while this is arguably a vulnerability, misuse of any framework, allowing untrusted input to configure things is always a bad idea. Um, so they kind of just uh, left it at that and so here was this critical vulnerability, unpatched, but then Log4Net comes back, comes back from the dead. Um, and they released um, 2.0.9, um, which, uh, and they released 2.0.9 in August 2020, but that didn't fully satisfy the CVE, so then they had to release version 2.0.10 to fully fix the CVE, uh, which came out in September. So if you could imagine having a dependency on Log4Net and from May till September, there was five months of knowing that you have a 9.8 critical CVE with no fix available. So, um, you know, what did organizations do? What can they do? You usually just have to figure out some sort of an alternative, right? It was very nice that Log4Net actually came back um, and now it's supported again. Um, and, and, it's, and it's carrying on. But that, uh, you know, scanning for end of support and understanding those things um, is always important when you're uh, trying to manage your dependencies. Now, I just told you about an end of support package, but what about a supported package, but they might not be fixing the vulnerability within your desired time frame? Um, this, you know, is, is a, uh, 
interesting case because you know the open source community is um, use as is, right? And and people are doing their best to keep things up to date, but and they're often doing it in their free time. So, uh, but what happens when there's a vulnerability in Lodash, which is a very very popular package? Um, and it had a CVS score of 7.4, so only a high severity vulnerability. But um, this vulnerability was reported in Hacker One in October 2019. The CVE was published in July 2020. So, that, so nine months went by where the CVE was known. But then the version that actually addressed the vulnerability was then finally published in February 2021 to fully resolve it. So, um, you know, we're talking about over a year of time of having a, a high criticality CVE where no fix was available. Um, and so like, these are scenarios that, that happen from time to time. And so if these are part of your dependencies having a plan in place on, on what to do is, is important. And I also just wanted to point out, you know, when I went to uh, Lodash uh, last week and I grabbed the screenshot here, you can see the downloads within the last seven days. And when you look at this CVE, you know that um, version 4.17 and 19 and below are affected by this vulnerability. And so over 2 million downloads of this vulnerability happened within the last seven days. So like it's still like a prominent problem across the industry in terms of OSS hygiene that people are downloading and using um, vulnerabilities with known CVEs today. Um, another interesting um, attack was uh, UA parser JS. Um, in this particular attack, the attacker did not compromise the GitHub account. Instead, they compromised the NPM account, and they were able to upload a new version of UA Parser JS that had nothing to do with the repo, but it had the new, it had the name, and again, it was the newest version of the package. And um, so this is this is a, a problem where, you know, the build environment was not directly connected to the newly published packaged version. And so GitHub has been doing some amazing work um, um, along with the NPM team around creating NPM package provenance so that now there's certain uh, packages out there that when they do their builds and they publish to NPM, you have that traceability back to the repo so that it directly mitigates against this type of a threat so that you're not worried about somebody compromising the NPM account and having nothing to do back to the repo. Um, other types of incidents um, include uh, colors. This unfortunately was a, was a self-sabotage. Um, the maintainer intentionally introduced uh, an infinite loop into their code. That's, that's it right there. That's the code snippet. Um, this was the same maintainer that maintained uh, Faker.js. Um, and with the Faker.js, the maintainer specifically said, I, I can't do this anymore, no more free work, pay me or fork this, right? And so, so this maintainer may have had similar motivations when it came to colors, um, but that's up to, to speculation. Um, but this type of an attack is, is um, tough because you know, we've all, uh, this was a, a trustworthy person, um, everything was fine, this person just um, lost that, that ability to continue to maintain it the way that they had been, um, and they, they hadn't been successful uh, pursuing different types of uh, uh, funding avenues. Um, more advanced attacks, though, um, are build time compromises. I'm sure we're all familiar with SolarWinds, but I'm gonna back us up to 2017. Um, the CCleaner build time compromise um, happened um, a while ago. This was a compile machine compromise where uh, because they had access on the compile machine, they had permissions to modify the C runtime library. So the attacker 
then modified the TLS initialization function. Uh, this was inside the Visual Studio runtime file and then allowed them to uh, uh, do a path injection to their attacker generated DLL file. And uh, the DLL file is the thing that allowed them to contact their command and control server and download the payload and continue to perform their second stage attack. Um, this is uh, difficult because the software industry at large um, hasn't really embraced reproducibility to the extent that we would uh, like all software to be. Software is not always deterministic and um, when you can't reproducibly build um, software, it's hard to tell if there was tampering that was occurring while the software was being built. Um, this threat actor was then also the exact same actor that went on and compromised ASUS Live Update in 2019, also a build time attack. That incident was dubbed a shadow hammer. And then we know that um, at the end of 2020, that's when solar winds happened. So like build time attacks are uh, very, very concerning. Um, and I think there's, there's uh, guidance out there in, in place and I'm gonna touch on that in a little bit. Um, but of course I couldn't do a talk about real life incidents without talking about the XZ uh, incident that came out. Um, I really liked uh, this article by, by Checksmarks because they have great graphics that kind of summarize the timeline. Um, and you could see that this attacker was dedicated uh, back from 2021 all the way into uh, 2024 in order to establish that trust, use social engineering to uh, convince people to, to gain access. Um, you can even see that in uh, 2023, the first bullet there on the left, um, the person also modified um, Google's OSS fuzz um, and we suspect that they, they modified the OSS fuzz to send uh, new alerts to his email address or his or her email address. And um, we suspect that they did that because if somebody were to di have discovered what they had done in the repo, he wanted to redirect all of those alerts to that, to that person um, rather than alerting like a broader sense of, uh, uh, of people. So this is um, just really interesting to see that the length of time and the patience that attackers have to compromise critical dependencies that um, we're all using today that, that make up that infrastructure that, that builds modern software today. And so when we reviewed all of these things, this is the summarized view of these real life incidents, um, we realized we needed requirements that directly address each of these different unique types of threats. And that by analyzing real world threats to cre create our requirements, we now have a um, um, threat-based risk reduction approach to securing your open source consumption. And so uh, that's how we came up with the secure supply chain consumption framework. Um, uh, at Microsoft, we developed that and we have been implementing it since 2019. We then published and contributed it to the Open SSF in 2022. It's part of the Supply Chain Integrity Working Group. Um, and uh, we continue to lead and maintain that framework um, within inside the, the Open SSF. Um, so, uh, you know, well, what is the S2C2? It, it's, it's a guide, it's, it's a framework of requirements that you can use that is hyper-focused on how do you securely consume and manage open source de dependencies within the developer's workflow. So the guidebook, which is available today inside their repo, um, it, it's a high level solution agnostic set of practices, a detailed list of requirements that are within each practice, um, it, has, it has the list of real world supply chain threats and how the requirements directly mitigate against those types of threats. Um, we then organize all of the requirements into a maturity model. Um, and uh, we have an implementation guide with links to suggested tools. Uh, there's even a process for assessing an organization's maturity or your team's maturity and a mapping of this framework 
to six other supply chain specifications so that you could see how these requirements satisfy these other controls. In addition, the NSA Enduring Security Framework uh, in December uh, published the Managing Open Source Software and SBOMS Guidebook in which they referenced the S2C2F as an industry specification that aligns with their guidance. So I highly recommend, um, um, yeah, I just thought that was kind of cool, like the, yeah, go in and say. Um, um, but I mentioned that, so we're, we're inside uh, OpenSF, but, but uh, how does that relate to Salsa? Um, a lot of people know, know what Salsa is. Uh, Salsa is very focused on um, the producer workflow. If you are a software producer, you can follow Salsa guidance on how to secure your source, your build, your release. Um, but even when you're um, a builder, you also consume. You also consume open source dependencies um, as part of that process. And that's where the S2C2F fits in. Um, the two frameworks, are they complement each other. And, um, and so you can use them together. So what does that look like? This is how we model the space. If this kind of makes up a CI-CD platform, you've got your source, build and release, you've got your dependencies as a horizontal, and you've got um, device and identity. Um, you know, the top layer is your producer layer, your middle layer there is the consumption layer, the bottom layer there is an access, devices and identities have access throughout all of the um, resources within your CI CD platform. Um, so Salsa is the, the framework of requirements that you could be using to secure your producer row. S2C2F is what you could be using to secure your consumption of open source. And uh, you can definitely look at leveraging zero trust principles to secure identity and access. And if you're a software organization and where software is your business, you should be underscoring that with making sure that your CI CD platform is adhering to secure configuration, has a dedicated security monitoring team that's monitoring it the way that they would monitor a production environment. You want to have incident response plans in place and obviously business continuity and disaster recovery. So that's how that's where S2C2F fits within the in the bigger picture. And um, so here's here's a little bit more diving in a little bit uh, into S2C2F. I mentioned that there are eight practices and it's starting with ingest. How you ingest open source um, into the developer's workflow is very, very important. Um, I rec recommend that you uh, work with your team or your organization to apply guardrails for consistency in how developers uh, consume open source. Again, going back to using that artifact repository rather than calling the, the open in internet. Um, and you have to use all of these practices uh, holistically in concert with each other. Um, you need to be inventorying your open source and updating them. You need to have enforcement policies in place where you're actually willing to break a build um, if it means protecting your developers from getting compromised from supply chain threats. Um, you need to have audit uh, practices in place so that you can make sure that these, these processes are being implemented correctly across your um, CI CD workflows. Um, scanning for vulnerabilities and malware. Um, and then even being able to rebuild um, and also be a positive member of the open source ecosystem by finding and fixing vulnerabilities and contributing those upstream. Um, the, those eight practices, each of those have requirements inside of them, and we organize those requirements into a maturity model. And the reason I did this is because um, a while ago, the prevalent rule of thumb was that if you have an OSS governance program, you should be inventorying your open source, scanning it for vulnerabilities, and keeping them up to date. I made that the bare minimum. That's level one. That, we, we have tools and technologies that help us do better here. Level two is all about, uh, so, so there's different themes. So, so the theme for level two is all about how do you improve secure consumption? 
and improve the speed at which you patch and update your open source vulnerabilities. So there's requirements such as um, use uh, automated um, updates on OSS, tools like Dependabot on, on GitHub. Um, having vulnerabilities surfaced as a comment in a pull request, that empowers the pull request reviewer to use that opportunity to say, no, don't contribute this brand new package that has a known vulnerability. Let's get that fixed while we're here in the pull request. Um, those types of things uh, allow you to operate faster and they reduce developer toil. And, and it helps you get closer towards that North Star vision of being able to update within three days. Level three is all about how do you protect yourself from accidentally consuming malicious open source. So this is making sure that you have a deny list to, to protect yourself from, from um, downloading known open source, that you're scanning for malware in addition to scanning for vulnerabilities, um, and that you uh, are enforcing OSS provenance. And level four is largely aspirational. This is um, advanced threat defense. So this is the things that you could do against the types of adversaries that are the most sophisticated, the ones that are gonna be performing compromises at build time. So level four is where, this is where you can um, rebuild the open source um, and, and use the rebuilt package uh, by I, I, I label this as uh, aspirational because usually you would only want to go to that length to mitigate that risk for your most critical uh, pieces of software. Um, um, however, there are um, services today that provide rebuilt open source. Um, additionally, uh, so what we'd like you to know is that the S2C2F is uh, uh, still partying on. We've got bi-weekly meetings and we have a lot of different goals. We, we want to spread awareness that, that uh, there is a framework of requirements that can help you address the threats in, in open source space. Um, we want to uh, improve the community engagement that we have um, and get more people joining our community calls um, and giving us feedback. Uh, and we want to increase adoption. We would love to hear stories from people out there that uh, have downloaded the guide, that have are, are finding, trying to implement it within their organization. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you. And we also want this to drive tooling innovation, right? Um, we want to, uh, scanners to be scanning for end of life. That's kind of like a, a thing that's not really done today in the open source space because it hasn't really been standardized. Um, and so I think there's a lot of uh, uh, improvement that can be done um, in this space as well. Um, and so, you know, we're working with the community uh, for um, assessing new open source threats. We are uh, creating supplemental material that for, for specific scenarios, uh, for deeper dives. And we're also pursuing international standardization for our specification. And so what can you do? Uh, immediately, please go to the repo, check it out. Uh, within a week, you can assess where you are within the maturity model, assess what requirements you already meet and where your gaps are. Um, and you can also get involved if, you, if you'd like. Uh, we, we'd be happy to see you. Um, and perhaps within a month, you could be modernizing your OSS governance program by adopting new tools that help you move up the maturity levels. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for, for listening today. Uh, happy to take some questions. Yeah, so um, um, 
uh, Michael Lieberman uh, is a one of the contributors on Guac, and um, and my understanding is that he's been working on um, making sure that Guac can also understand um, S2C2F attestations. So that's um, a new area that's that's going out. Um, Within the OpenSSF, you could read our strategy doc on how we are, because you started your question with how are we working across the OpenSSF. Um, so we went and looked across all the different working groups to see where we fit in. Um, there was a, a security tools guide and we made a contribution to make sure that um, the types of tools that we're recommending that help you update your dependencies faster, get listed in the security tools guide. Um, the SKF uh, is, a, is a place that's developing training and we've written an outline. We need to follow up with them, but we need to, we wanna create like an S2C2F training group. Um, and we've also started creating um, a tool that like a GitHub action that you could run um, within your repo and, and it would check to see if you are compliant with any of the S2C2F requirements an output an attestation that I am level two compliant. Um, so that's a POC, it's not done, but we do have a, a repo that's um, um, in the works. So those are just touching on the areas where, where we're collaborating, um, but there's probably others, other opportunities we might be missing. If you have ideas, please let me know. I hope that answered your question. the link up there. Yes. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, we've actually received um, kind of like compliments that ours was easier to adopt um, than, than some of the others, that our language is more clear, that we have real world incidents and you can see how this requirement directly mitigates against that threat. Um, I guess the awareness piece is part of the, the challenge. Um, we want people to know that S2C2F can be paired with any other framework like Salsa. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know of any other barriers. Um, if you th th have feedback on on barriers, I'd love to know what those are because we'd love to to reduce them. We want to increase adoption. That's one of our goals. Um, when you start searching across the landscape, you can see there's many companies out there that are starting to use S2C2F as part of their product roadmap. So that um, if you're a customer that's that wants to be compliant with the S2C2F, by adopting said tool, you would automatically meet blah and blah and blah requirement. Um, so I know that there's, there's a lot of that out there already. And, um, you know, I think, I think uh, that's, that's what it is. I mean, they're, they're requirements, so they can be met in many different ways by many different tools. And, and so, the barrier to adoption is really just adopting new tools to help you meet these requirements. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so pro proactive security reviews is a, is a level three maturity thing. Um, in our, our model, if you are, um, let's see here, if you are um, mirroring the source to an internal location, that can also help with uh, disaster recovery stuff. But if you have the source locally, you can also run any sort of tools that you want on it, um, as opposed to relying on the tools that from, from whatever repo it was. Um, 
and by running your own security tools, that's how you might be able to learn of net new zero day vulnerabilities that have not been reported externally yet. So, um, the, and then and then there's a, uh, different types of tools. So there's there's binary analyzers, which obviously you don't need the source for. But then there's also like static analyzers, which you would need the source for. Um, there are different tools that are in our implementation guide that um, can help you look for back doors. They can um, scan for vulnerabilities. So uh, it, it's kind of like a smorgasbord of things you want to look for. Um, again, that's, that's getting into the, when you're at that level of maturity and you have those resources where your company can review your, your most critical dependencies, then um, you might be setting your company up to be a better contributor back and making the ecosystem safer because you are doing these proactive security reviews on the source. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, I would set ourselves at, at level three. There are pockets of the company where we are level four. You know, things like... Uh, Kubernetes, right? We have our um, AKS, Azure Kubernetes, that is where we are um, rebuilding our own version of Kubernetes that runs great on Azure. So like there are examples of that where we are um, rebuilding from source. But in terms of like developer dependencies, um, um, we, we are not uh, like at scale rebuilding things um, for our own consumption. I'm not sure I have a fully fledged roadmap or um, um, on on exactly where we want to go. We would entertain those ideas um, by going the the international standardization route. We know that uh, countries like Europe would latch on to this uh, and might even require them in uh, in. Uh, like contracts or, or things like that for, for uh, government and, and uh, commercial. Um, if we are able to generate um, attestations throughout the development of a piece of software that you are compliant with certain controls, if we get to that place where supply chain evidence can be shared more easily, um, so, so generated, signed, stored and shared more easily with, with consumers, um, then it's possible that, you know, uh, Microsoft as a consumer of other people's open source, we might require people to provide us attestations that, you know, and I think that's just kind of uh, the, the organic nature of supply chains is um, you want to trust your suppliers that are, that are giving you, you know, dependencies into your own uh, production environment or in your own code. And um, I think in general, the uh, supply chain security space is gonna get towards a, a place where we are generating attestations and signing them and distributing them at scale. Um, there are 
efforts in the IETF um, standards working group called SKIT, Supply Chain Integrity, Transparency, and Trust, um, that I think represent the ideas that I just shared with you here. So I, th I think uh, we want to, sh short story, we want people to be generating attestations um, that they comply with this. But what do they do with those attestations? Who's asking for them? We, we, need, the, we need the adoption to grow and, and then we need people to care that somebody is satisfying these on the other side. And that's why going through the standardization process is uh, so important to us. Thank you, everybody.